We're scared. One of the things we believe is that adults should tell the truth about themselves and they should go first rather than interrogating their children. They need to tell so the children will feel safe to tell also. And they got to never, never, never tell a child don't feel bad or don't feel scared or don't feel sad. Because the truth is I think we're all feeling all sad, right. we're all feeling bad, we're all feeling scared, and we're all feeling a little angry. And all of these feelings are valid and should be heard, not fixed. We don't fix feelings, we listen to them and acknowledge how truthful they are. And then we can go on with the next moment in our life. Grief counselor Russell Friedman, thank you very much. And as we watch uh, Hillary, Senator Hillary Clinton uh, shake the hands of so many firefighters in New York, um, I have to remark that what's so difficult about this story for so many people is the idea of saying goodbye, as many people saying goodbye to Father Judge today in New York City. Several of the victims of Tuesday's terror were able to actually make goodbye calls to their loved ones, and our Thelma Gutierrez was able to talk with a few of the families who are on the receiving end of these painful yet very appreciated farewells. September 11, American Airlines Flight 11 crashes into the North Tower. Jill Gartenberg's husband is inside. Called my office. I got to my office probably two minutes after he left his first message on my machine saying there was a fire in his building on his floor. He didn't know if he was going to make it. 18 minutes later, United Flight 175 slams into the South Tower. Lori Van Auken's husband, Kenneth, makes a final call home. It was just horrible. It was really just horrible. I could hear the terror in his voice, and he was trying to sound like he was calm for us, but you could hear the, the chaos in the background and the terror in his voice. I hope I live. Some 30 minutes later, somewhere above the Pentagon on American Airlines Flight 77, Barbara Olson calls her husband, Ted, and tells him hijackers have taken over. She told me that she had been herded to the back of the plane she mentioned that they had used knives and box cutters to, to hijack the plane. I had to tell her about the two airplanes that had hit the World Trade Center. Why? I just felt that I had to. On United Flight 93 over Pennsylvania, Thomas Burnett calls his wife. And he said that um, somebody was already dead, that they had stabbed somebody, and that they were all going to die, and that... Uh, They were going to try to do something. Mark Bingham calls his mother in the midst of chaos. He said, I just want to let you know that I love you all. Uh, there are three men on board who have taken over the aircraft, and they say they have a bomb. And at that point, we were cut off. He wasn't able to say anything else. Moments later, the plane went down, and families forever lost their chance to talk with one another. Some family members will take comfort in the fact that they were able to say their goodbyes, um, that they were able to express certain feelings that they have, you know, such as I love you. And Elisa Van Kirk is a medical social worker who deals with trauma. That they were able to communicate with the people in their lives that were important to them, and that we can take comfort from. One of the last things Melissa Hughes did on September 11th is call her husband, Sean. Sean, it's me. I just want to let you know I love you. And I'm Thelma Gutierrez, CNN, Los Angeles. Good afternoon, I'm Aaron Brown in New York. On this day when New York starts to bury its dead and the rescue workers begin or continue on, this long, difficult work of sifting through and clearing out what was the World Trade Center buildings here in New York. Funerals now going on 
funerals for Michael Judge, the chaplain, funerals for fire chief out on Long Island who died the other day as well. And of course around the city and in other cities too, funerals going on for people without titles, without position, people who died on Tuesday. They are not the funerals that will get the attention or the coverage, but their deaths are no less significant than those that do. I'm Aaron Brown. As we say, we're joined now by Judy Woodruff in Washington and Darren Kagan in Atlanta as we take you through the afternoon here. Of this longest week, it, it's hard to believe that it's uh, only Saturday. Here are the latest developments in the story at this hour. President Bush has again described this all as an act of war. President meeting with his national security team today. He said, we are at war and we will smoke out the terrorists, said the president. He says that Osama bin Laden is the prime suspect in Tuesday's attack. This is a line the administration has said. This is one of the first times we've seen, by the way, the vice president since Tuesday. It is possible we've seen him before. I don't recall it, however, this meeting taking place a short time ago. As we say today, also the funerals are now beginning. They are beginning here in New York and elsewhere. Funerals for fire chiefs and fire chaplains, funerals for firemen, future funerals for passengers on airplanes and office workers in buildings. These are long and painful goodbyes. And we are beginning also now to get a sense of the economic dimension of all of this. Continental Airlines said today that it will furlough 12,000 employees. They'll go off the payroll. Uh, the airlines obviously have been hammered in this. They have not been able to uh, fly for a week. It's not clear when they'll be at full strength again, when airports are functioning fully, when passengers feel comfortable buying tickets and going to the gates and getting on those planes. The Congress is moving to offer economic assistance to the airlines, more than $2 billion worth. But for now, Continental will put 12,000 employees on furlough as it tries to recover economically from the disaster that hit on Tuesday. Those are the headlines. And now we begin putting a little more meat on all of it. We begin by going to the Pentagon and CNN's Bob Frank. And Bob, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Aaron, and uh, we're going to be able to give you some idea of the devastation that occurred at the Pentagon. Uh, the Pentagon, the military, has provided some video. It shot over and inside the area that was damaged. First, you see the aerial shots. You can see uh, shots that we've not been able to see for a while because, of course, airspace has been severely, severely limited here. Aerial shots to show just how extensive it was when three of the corridors of the Pentagon were badly damaged when the American Airlines plane crashed into it on Tuesday. Now, of course, inside is where it is really stark. You see just an absolute chaos. And this is uh, the video shot three days after the collision actually occurred, three days in which a huge amount had been done. Uh, the video shot yesterday, we're slowly making our way into the building. You can see holes that were created not by the plane, but uh, oftentimes like this one, uh, holes that were punched out by the people who are trying to get inside. And you can see the massive damage to the building. Damage, by the way, which might have been worse, except for the fact that this section had just been renovated and it was really strongly reinforced, reinforced with glass, for instance, it was very blast resistant. So it prevented quite a bit of the tragedy that might have occurred. As it is, they're already estimating that about 189 people will have died in this. You will see just how difficult it would have been for rescue workers and the people who are trying to effect repairs to get inside the building. And you can see overhead just how widespread the damage was. Now, this is a massive building with about 17 and a half miles of corridor. Among those picking their way inside the building for the military were members of an honor guard here, the ones you normally see at Arlington Cemetery in spit and polish, but this time they were doing anything but their ceremonial duties. Got soldiers from the uh, 3rd U.S. Infantry, the honor guard, are in there. And this is the conditions they have to work in. They're the Tyvek suits, the respirators, goggles, and helmets. 
And they also have boots uh, on. Terry Mitchell, Terry Mitchell, who is uh, a Pentagon spokesman, showing what was going on. And while the repair to this building was taking place, at the very same time, the full operation of its primary mission was being restored. The planning is going on now for whatever military action is being taken in this virtual war that has been declared on the United States, according to the administration. And of course, uh, phase number one has been the authorization for a call up of the reserves. Reserves that uh, authorized 50,000 to be called up, although of course there are about a million 300,000 reservists in the United States military force, about half of the entire armed forces of the United States. 50,000 authorized, 35,000 will be called out, spread out not just among the traditional Defense Department uh, uh, forces, but also the Coast Guard, which comes under the Transportation Department. The individual units that are affected have not been announced, are probably still being developed. In fact, individuals themselves are still being put into the proper slots. We can expect that information to come out in the next few days. It is a very, very slow process to get ready for whatever military action is taken in response to this calamity that has hit the United States. Uh, and of course, a very slow process, Aaron, to build a building. It's going to take several hundred million dollars and probably, we're told, a couple of years. Aaron? Uh, let's talk about what's going on uh, in those parts of the building that's not being damaged. People are coming to work still. Offices are open. Uh, business, certainly not as usual, but business is getting done. Because this is the business of the military here. Uh, this is the business of the military, and of course the irony is that the military right now has the primary business here. The administration has made that very clear to try and come up with the retaliation that the United States plans to put into effect. A very, very relentless retaliation, they're saying. As for people coming to work, a large part of this building, probably about a third of it, is a uh, little bit uh, damaged or is still questionable. There may be structural damage that could be questionable, but all staff people are asked to come to work and they can be reassigned offices. You you know, of course, this is the world's largest office building. You know, uh, you've been there for a couple days, and this is my first best look at, uh, at all of this. But when you looked at these new pictures, uh, and in a sense, there's a term of art in television, that you, you got the wide shot here, uh, were you surprised at how broad the damage was? Well, you know, actually it reinforces what uh, rescue officials have been telling us for a couple of days, that they were just going through terrible debris, that it took sometimes tremendous effort just to set the stuff apart uh, and to get in the, the lifts and all the backhoes and that type of thing they needed to do that. And they also had to face the fear of a collapse. As reinforced as this particular section was, there was always this constant concern of a collapse. And the, one of the scenes that we showed a little while ago is one that shows all the wood beams that have been put up to support this so they could move on to the next area and put up more wood beams, that type of thing. It is a very tedious process, as you might understand and a sad one because wherever they go they find more bodies they still haven't given us by the way an estimate of the number of bodies uh, the, the actual number by the way they've just told us that they're estimating now about 190 and, and when they talk about 190 189 that includes the people who are at the Pentagon actually at work at the Pentagon and the people who were on the airplane that hit the Pentagon correct that's correct what they've done they've combined uh, the passengers uh, the number of passengers on the airplane and the people who are unaccounted for and that's how they've come up with their estimate one, one other or two other perhaps quick things um, you, you've been around that building over the years a, a fair amount is uh, security just uh, indescribable uh, at this point it's heavy it's very heavy. Uh, you better not be caught walking without your pass in this building right now because somebody will stop you and, as a matter of fact, could place you under arrest. Uh, wherever you turn, there are people in body armor uh, carrying uh, AK-47s, that type of thing. Obviously, this is a building that always has heavy security, uh, but it's, it's, it's visibly uh, much more extensive now. Bob, thanks. That is, uh, you see that overhead uh, shot that we saw the, the flyover for the first time. It is uh, quite chilling. You get a sense of the magnitude of the hit on the Pentagon. That is something. Thank you, Bob Franken at the Pentagon for us this afternoon. As you see to first for the first time, just it almost goes as we see it, at least here, the, the damage goes through those concentric, that series of concentric lines uh, that are offices in the Pentagon. It doesn't just take out the first layer, but you can see damage going in the inner circles. I, I understand they're not circles, but those inner lines of office space going straight through. 
and you get a sense of why they're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to repair it. It is uh, after yesterday's dreary Saturday, or dreary, dreary Friday here in New York. Uh, the sun's out today, and as we were coming in, we got home for the first time yesterday, in fact, um, life was coming back a little bit to normal. Uh, traffic was starting to build in parts of the west side of New York where uh, this tragedy essentially places itself. Um, but the one thing we noticed beyond all the cars with American flags and cabs with American flags is uh, there was far less horn honking today. People seem a little bit calmer in it all than New Yorkers sometimes get. Uh, horns constantly going off in the city. Uh, but today, at least as I was coming in, it, it seemed people were a little more patient. Maybe it was my imagination and wishful thinking. Maybe it is, in fact, true, but that's how it's seen. Elizabeth Cohen has been, for the last several days, as many of you know, uh, at the armory here in New York where the missing have come. It, it's actually, Elizabeth, when we talked last night, I think we both had a sense that the mood there had shifted quite significantly from, particularly from Thursday to Friday. Where are you today? Well, today, the people that I'm talking to, Aaron, still have hope. We're actually going to speak with a woman who is looking for her brother, and she says she still has hope. But we are hearing more people say that it is getting harder to maintain that hope. We talked, actually, with an American Red Cross worker a little while ago who said, you know what, on Wednesday, people didn't really want counseling. They just wanted to go out into the hospitals and look. Today, more people are saying, you know what, I need to sit down and talk. I need counseling. Some 3,000 people have been to the armory here to to register information about their missing relatives. And today, for the first time, they've offered DNA testing. That means that they scrape the inside of the cheek of a close relative to the person who's missing so that that DNA can then be cross-matched later on. Um, I want to introduce you to a woman of, of great strength, Miri Ortali Melites, um, who is looking for her brother, um, Peter Ortali. Um, tell me, Mary, when was the last time someone heard from your brother? Um, he was after the first plane crashed into the, the World Trade Center, he called my mother you know, and said, you know, a plane just crashed, turn on the news. Um, after that, he called his wife. And then I believe he received a phone call from a friend in California, also with the news of a plane crash. Um, and then that's the last anyone's ever heard from him. And then apparently just from bits and pieces from people in the, um, who work with him on the floor, you know, the evacuate the building um, announcement came on. Everyone was leaving the floor. The last person leaving said no one was left on the floor. Um, and, you know, we, haven't, we just haven't heard anything. Um, he did appear on the survivorlist.com um, and also on a nyc.com list. Um, a different phonetic spelling, but, you know, it's, it just seemed too kind of ironic not to be him. And then there was a... Um, he, the name of the survivor list, that list went down, and then the other list actually went off the, the, you know, is not on the Internet again today. So, you know, the Red Cross had said as soon as we heard it that there was really, they couldn't, there's no validity to it. All they can go by is what the hospitals are actually giving them. So, you know, we kind of, our family has been back and forth. Uh, people came up on Tuesday to go to the hospitals and do some of the searching. They left yesterday. We came up yesterday and kind of doing the same thing. Um, going back to all the hospitals, putting up more pictures. I mean, just in the hope that, you know, if you took the stairwell with him, if he was if he was next to you, did you see him? Was he helping somebody? You know, him and um, one of his good friends, Dennis McHugh, his boss, Eddie Martovich. I mean, these are people, you know, that we used to see all the time. And now it seems kind of surreal that I'm, you know, hanging up missing posters with my brother all over New York City. It's, it's just, it's unbelievable. It's, but we do, we still have hope. You know, I ran into a lot of, um, I ran into two doctors last night who said you have to continue to have hope. You know, they're, they're getting through all that stuff, you know, every minute, every hour down there, you know, and telling how hard all the people are working down there. So, I mean, we're hopeful. We, we still are. We really are. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mary. Thank you so much. Mary, who is one of the thousands who is looking for lost relatives here, looking at the armory on the corner of 26th and Lexington. Aaron? I, I, uh, I, when people talk of their hope, it's, it's very moving. I wonder if, in, at times like this, if there's a terrible, I don't mean this to sound cold, there is a terrible 
a sense of helplessness here. Uh, someone you love a lot is gone. You need to go someplace, do something to shake yourself of the helplessness. And I wonder if some people are coming down just to be with others who are in their situation. Well, you know, it's interesting because the counselor who we talked to earlier said a woman who was looking for her husband said, I'm here because if I go home, I will feel as if I have given up on looking for my husband. But I think it is more than just wanting company. There was a gentleman we talked to who was looking for his brother, Pablo Ortiz. He saw on a list that an Ortiz was listed as being at a hospital way up on the Upper West Side, and he ran, got in the cab, went and looked, and it was the wrong Ortiz. So there are some leads that people are trying to follow. Elizabeth, thank you. Elizabeth Cohen at the Armory to Washington. Judy. We are, we are told that there's a new development with regard to the president. Uh, for that, let's go near Camp David to CNN's White House correspondent, Kelly Wallace. Kelly? You know, all day we've been talking about how Mr. Bush has really sort of stepped up his language. For the first time, he is now saying that the U.S. is at war and that he is not going to be satisfied with just a token response, but with what he calls a sweeping and effective campaign. Mr. Bush also saying that uh, terrorists may hide out in holes, but that the U.S. would go ahead and smoke them out. Well, we asked Ari Fleischer if the president was laying the groundwork and preparing for the American people for the possibility that the U.S. could use ground troops to try and take care of those terrorists responsible, deemed responsible for these attacks. And Ari Fleischer, Fleischer saying nothing has been ruled out. Now, Mr. Bush talking to reporters earlier today before a meeting with his national security team, included in that meeting, of course, Vice President Cheney, as well as his top national security advisors. And before he, uh, that meeting got underway, Mr. Bush using some of the same words his father used when he announced the uh, backing for the Persian Gulf War 10 years ago, Mr. Bush saying that this act will not stand. There's no question about it. This act will not stand. We will find those who did it. We will smoke them out of their holes. We will get them running. And we'll bring them to justice. We will not only deal with the, those who dare attack America, uh, we, will we will deal with those who harbor them and feed them and house them. Make no mistake about it. Underneath our, underneath our tears is the strong determination of America to win this war. And we will win it. One other thing that President Bush did today, for the very first time, he named suspected terrorist Osama bin Laden as a, quote, prime suspect. He also said that if bin Laden thinks that he can keep away and hide out from the U.S., and its allies. He was, quote, sorely mistaken. Now, Judy, as you know, U.S. officials not talking about any military options that this administration will be considering, but we do know the president spending the weekend at the presidential retreat at Camp David, meeting with his national security team, discussing a range of options, political, economic, and, of course, military options, again, to deal with what he calls a sweeping and effective campaign against terrorism. Judy? All right, Kelly Wallace uh, reporting near Camp David. The president today saying this will be a different kind of conflict against a different kind of enemy. Joining me now, Peter Bergen, who is writing a book on Osama bin Laden. Peter, I just want to cite something else the president said today. He said it's, it's, a, not, it's a conflict without battlefields or beachheads, a conflict with opponents who believe they are invisible, and yet they are mistaken. Uh, do they believe they're invisible, Peter? Well, they're certainly in a country that they know intimately well and the United States knows very little about. The United States closed its embassy in Afghanistan in 1989. We don't have any information uh, on the ground uh, about the situation there, really. We have to rely on other uh, people like the Pakistanis for information. So if you're, gonna, if you're considering a ground campaign in Afghanistan, you're going into one of, A, one of the most inhospitable places in the world, B, a place bin Laden knows intimately well because he's been there on and off since 1986, and C, a place we have very little information about. 
Let me ask you about the neighboring country of Pakistan. As, as you know, the president, the administration has laid down, a, thrown down the gauntlet, in effect, to Pakistan and other countries, saying you're either with us or you're against us. Here are specific things we want you to do, and you're either on our side or you're not. My question to you is, how likely is it that Pakistan is going to go along with some of these things? I think the Pakistani leader, General Musharraf, is in a very difficult position. Um, he obviously wants to go along with the United States. Uh, Pakistan has traditionally been an ally of the United States. But you've got to remember that Pakistan, uh, Osama bin Laden, is a very popular man in, in Pakistan. Uh, it's a common first name now for sons, Osama. You see Osama bakeries springing up. Uh, on the street in Pakistan, Osama is a bit of a hit folk hero. So Musharraf has to balance the interests of A, uh, you know, being somewhat accommodating the United States, but B, the political reality that Osama bin Laden is a rather popular man in his own country. So what that will mean in practice, we don't know yet from the Pakistanis. Does that mean we'll give you airspace? Does that mean we'll allow you to use our country as a staging ground for a ground operation? Airspace. All right, let's talk about st staging. Are there bases already in Pakistan that the U.S. could use if it decided to go after uh, bin Laden and his people in Afghanistan? Uh, there are there are bases. I mean, actually, an interesting historical note. Gary Powers, remember the U-2, the, the, the pilot who was shot down by the Russians in 62, took off from a, a, a base inside Pakistan. So there are plenty of air, air, air bases near the border that one could use. Uh, I just think it's, it's going to be politically very hard for uh, Musharraf to kind of sign on to that. But if he doesn't, uh, he must know there are consequences. I, I, yes, I mean, it's, he's in a very tough spot. But uh, I think that last time we, uh, we sent cruise missile attacks in, in bin Laden's direction, we didn't actually inform the Pakistanis uh, about anything about that plan until the cruise missiles were actually in the air. And a general actually went to the, the, uh, the leadership of the country and said, uh, you're not under attack from India, your traditional uh, rival. Uh, you're, these are the United States cruise missiles going against bin Laden. Obviously, this time, we're not going to, everybody will be informed. But one last note, Judy, surprise is key to any military operation. We clearly have right. uh, sacrificed that ability at that moment. Bin Laden must be planning some kind of, uh, you know, countervailing measure. Well, that, and I asked you about that when you and I talked about this a, a day or so ago. I said, yeah. every day that goes by where the administration talks about or, or says it's talking about what it plans to do, gives them, whether it's bin Laden or any of the people who support him, time to hide, to go off and make other plans, and makes it all the more harder for us to carry out a retaliation. I'm reminded a little bit of how Pre President Bush's uh, father, who, um, you know, there was, there was, a, there was a, basically this coalition building that's going on. I mean, you sacrifice surprise, but you do build a co coalition if you have enough time, which is obviously what his son is doing now. All right, Peter Bergen, uh, formerly a producer for CNN, now writing a book about Osama bin Laden. Peter, thank you very much. Now our correspondent Eileen O'Connor, who's been following the investigation for the last few days. Eileen, you have some new information. We do, uh, Judy. Uh, so far, law enforcement sources say that they have detained, and the Justice Department has confirmed this, uh, at least 25 people for possible INS violations. Now, this is a way that they can detain some people. Uh, eventually, they will have to perhaps issue dozens more, they say, material witness warrants. And that is another way that they can detain people that they want for questioning. Now, law enforcement sources say they are operating under the assumption that more attacks were planned and either were thwarted or are still a possibility, but they are making rapid headway. Two men were detained in Texas and have been transported to New York for questioning. They may not have been involved, but there are striking coincidences and sources say several reasons they came to the attention of the authorities. Law enforcement sources say Mohammed Jawid Asmath and Ayub Ali Khan both had tickets from Newark to San Antonio, Texas on Tuesday. Their plane was diverted to St. Louis, where they boarded a train for San Antonio. According to sources, they had box cutters. Now, people on the doomed flight said on cell phone calls that the hijackers had box cutters as weapons. What authorities are looking at are, there, are young men and women or relatives in their 20s, Middle Eastern country citizenship, predominantly Saudi Arabian, visas that indicated they were students receiving flight training or are pilots, and who have connections with the dead hijackers that have been identified, like the same or similar last names. Now, several of the hijackers lived here in San Diego. Neighbors say they didn't mingle, and sources say they were attending flight schools there. Now, neighbors say they kept themselves and to, they kept to themselves and they left in the dark.
Uh, the neighbors also said that they were on cell phones and used laptops, uh, and they looked to be uh, laptops with complicated programs. Several law enforcement sources say they had been looking at a man near Boston this summer. In his apartment, they found flight manuals, information on Boeing aircraft, and what appears that he also appears to have been attending flight school. They will not say whether that man is in custody here or overseas. Interestingly, my, uh, Judy, the several sources have pointed me to testimony in the trial of the embassy bombing, where people linked to bin Laden talked about members of his organization receiving flight training. FBI Director Robert Mueller admitted, if authorities had looked at this possibility more closely, this might have been averted. There were a uh, number of individuals happened to receive training at flight schools here uh, is news, quite obviously. If we had understood that to be the case, uh, uh, we would have, uh, perhaps one could have averted this. Now, one of the things law enforcement uh, authorities say, and we've been seeing this uh, in the evidence of backtracking the steps of these men, is that they were very clean shaven, they kept to themselves, very quiet. Neighbors just constantly keep remarking that it was just very difficult to know. So that's one of the things that authorities are, are also wanting that kind of information to get out so that people can so perhaps be on the lookout for people that might be linked to this. There's also, of course, concern that this could cause a backlash against a lot of innocent people, and nobody wants that. Judy? All right, uh, Eileen O'Connor, thanks very much. And of course, we'll be coming back to you as the day goes on. Darren Kagan. Judy, we want to get our viewers up to date this half hour with the latest headlines in America's new war, beginning with President Bush, who today declared to the nation, quote, we are at war. He is huddled with his national security team at Camp David. He is planning retaliatory action against those behind Tuesday's terror. Today, Mr. Bush, for the first time, publicly branded Osama bin Laden as a prime suspect. The first of what will be thousands of funerals was held today in New York outside of Washington. New York's fire chief, first deputy and chaplain are being memorialized. Also in Arlington, Virginia, service for Barbara Olson. She was the wife of U.S. Solicitor General Ted Olson and she was on board that flight that crashed into the Pentagon. Also well remembered here at CNN as a conservative commentator. And the financial fallout from the terrorist attack is beginning. Continental Airlines today saying it's laying off 12,000 workers. The airlines have been shut down much of the week, of course, and many are operating on reduced schedules now. Just the first of, Aaron, I'm sure what we're going to see in terms of economic impact, the airline's just one of many businesses that are going to feel the brunt of this disaster. Well, and they are big businesses. There are, in this city at least, lots of small businesses, delis, grocery stores, dry cleaners, the rest, uh, that down in that part of Manhattan. Uh, behind us that uh, have had no business either. Uh, it's a very difficult time and adding up the cost of this uh, will take a long time but it will be enormous. Uh, we, we mentioned a moment ago that there was a funeral here in New York for the Reverend Michael Judge, one of the uh, fire department chaplains. Among those who were there today, uh, New York Senator Hillary, uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton and um, with Mrs. Clinton at this was another New Yorker, her husband, the former President Bill Clinton, and he talked to us briefly uh, as he left. I think the story of the courage of these firefighters is just beginning to be known. The dimensions of it, the, the numbers of their losses, and how they perished. It was an amazing thing. An act of courage and love that was just amazing. Step back. Step back. I'm, I'm honored that we could be here today and that my wife could speak because we we admired Father Mike. But he today stands for all the firefighters and the police officers and the others who lost their lives. Here. A little hard to hear at points, but at one point he said uh, the acts of heroism were amazing. The former president with his wife at the funeral of Reverend Michael Judge. One of the most important, both symbolic and practical things uh, that need to happen now after this terrible tragedy is that Wall Street needs to get back to business. Wall Street, of course, has been closed. All the exchanges, the, the exchanges here in the United States have been closed since Tuesday. This weekend down on, on the street, they are testing the systems, the phones, the computers, everything else, in hopes they'll be able to open Monday morning at 9.30. Greg Clarkin is down in the street. 
literally on Wall Street, and uh, you can tell us more about that, Greg. Hi there, Aaron. I'll tell you, after hours and hours of testing and retesting the infrastructure system at the New York Stock Exchange this morning, just moments ago, Dick Grasso, he's the chairman and CEO of the NYSE, he said our systems are all go, and come 9.30, Monday morning, trading will indeed resume at the New York Stock Exchange. So this morning, what we have were technicians going over the vast telecommunications network that links NYSE member firms and other locations and processes electronic trades. So that system has proven to be up and running and intact, and they do expect to have trading begin at 9.30 Monday morning. Now, you may know the opening uh, bell will be something special. Dick Rosso promised uh, that in his conference call that is still on their way. He said they will ring the opening bell. There will be two minutes of silence, followed by a rendition of God Bless America, and the folks ringing the opening bell will be city, state, and national government representatives, as well as representatives from the New York Police Department, Fire Department, and Port Authority. Now, a little bit earlier this week when trading was shut down on the New York Stock Exchange, there was a memorial bell that was rung in honor of the victims of this tragedy, and so they will resume trading again on Monday morning with the traditional opening bell and quite a ceremony. And indeed, Aaron, this was a uh, very symbolic, symbolic um, move by the New York Stock Exchange to make sure that trading would resume on Monday morning. They have been working around the clock with Verizon, the local phone carrier here in New York, to make sure that the telecommunications system is up and running. And again, after technicians uh, test and retested this morning. Uh, Dick Grasso just declaring that indeed trading will resume Monday morning at 9.30 on the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. Aaron? Uh, Greg, a couple things that just help our viewers um, not familiar with New York, Wall Street, the Stock Exchange, uh, certainly a shot they're very familiar with the inside of the exchange is how far from ground zero. It is maybe a block and a half to two blocks uh, east of ground zero, Aaron, and we were down there yesterday speaking with Mr. Grasso and getting a tour of the building, and he said, fortunately, the building has come out of this unscathed. It is a landmark historic building, more than 100 years old, but despite that, the building uh, did not suffer any structural damage. They still want to make sure that water, electricity, the basic uh, functions necessary for the folks coming to work down there will be intact, and although that may be spotty at times, they believe they have uh, enough adequate facilities to take care of things. And then also, Aaron, there's the uh, logistical problem. There's a lot of folks in that building. 3,000 alone work on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. They've worked around the clock with the city to make sure that folks have access to the financial district and to the NYSE specifically. There'll be incredibly stringent security measures to gain access, but they do believe that all things should go smoothly. And again, the uh, NYSE itself, that landmark building, very fortunate that it did not suffer any structural damage. Grasso pointed out a lot of the improvements made over the uh, recent decades to re reinforce the building, and that was one of the reasons they believe it came out of this unscathed. Aaron? And just uh, one other thing. When you talk to uh, people associated with the, the New York Stock Exchange, the other market as well, um, are they nervous about not the mechanics of the opening, not whether the phones work? I'm sure they're nervous about that. Are they nervous about what investors are going to do when that bell rings? Sure, Aaron. There is a little apprehension as to what to expect after four days of non-trading. There is a kind of common belief that you may see a bit of uh, a knee-jerk sell-off, a little bit of volatility, and also keep in mind just some of the elements of the market. There's been an incredibly weak economic picture, an incredibly weak corporate profit picture for people to deal with, not to mention the long delay in trading. But uh, folks do believe that uh, after the early choppiness, which may result in um, a sell-off early on, that things should stay stabilize fairly quickly. And the, some folks do believe this uh, prolonged delay in resuming trading may actually have helped to calm people down a little bit rather than if they were to have been able to resume trading earlier this week. Yeah, I mean, people have been able to see, professional investors at least, have been able to see how the world markets have uh, responded. And there was some choppiness is, uh, I think, the word you guys use, but uh, some choppiness, but they seem to stabilize. And perhaps that's what we'll see Monday. That's going to be some moment, though, isn't it, when that bell rings and uh, and the business of American capitalism, symbolically at least, uh, begins again. Thanks, it, Greg. It, sure. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it will, indeed, it will indeed, Aaron. Uh, that, that opening bell, they've turned into quite a ceremony, and they do believe that this one will be a very emotional morning there as these folks get back onto that floor. Thank you very much. Uh, the um, Behind us, you know, every minute or so, we look in back of us and, and see the plume of smoke, and every day it, it seems a little less, but still today, as I, as I look back there, it's still there. Uh, we're Saturday afternoon, and that site continues to smolder, uh, and now I'm, I wonder what, at what point we'll all look back from, from our location here, and it will be clear that there won't be that smoke, that awful reminder of what took place. As we go from 
hospital to armory to funeral, we forget sometimes that uh, in all of the madness that has gone on, in fact, there were moments of uh, great joy. Uh, people who thought that they had lost someone found out otherwise, reunions took place, um, families made whole again. Um, some examples here from CNN's Bruce Burkhardt. Another day in the Red Cross shelter in Gramercy Park for Rose Franklin. Another day wondering what happened to her husband, Harry. I hear a bang. On Tuesday morning, election day in New York, Rose and Harry were working as volunteers at the polling station on Chambers Street, just a few blocks away from the World Trade Center. I go out and I, I see all that smoke. While Harry stayed inside, Rose wandered outside to check out the big boom. She wandered too far. By the time she tried to return, chaos had taken over and she was swept up in the stampede. It kept pushing everybody up north, up north, up north. Now confused and wondering where her husband was, the 81-year-old Rose stumbled along for two and a half miles before winding up at a shelter. It was there that she met a volunteer named Sergio, or as Rose calls him, her angel. At the beginning, she was one more uh, person there. Slowly, you get together and you talk, which is really the only thing you can do. At first, Rose said she had no family, but after warming up to Sergio, said she had a son in Boston. Though she didn't know his phone number or where he worked, Sergio tracked him down. It paid off. The son reported he had received two messages from his father. He said he was alive and well, but the message didn't say where he was. He's not sure how to talk to an answering machine, and he's probably pretty confused. He's always been on these heart pills because he had a triple bypass. So uh, I've never known him to be without those pills. Sergio tried everything, searching shelters, hospitals. Then I went to the armory, um, hoping that he would be there looking for her. He wasn't. So that was to be our story. A couple in their golden anniversary year, separated by tragedy, the end. Well, not quite. We so, got him. What? He left a message on my phone. The husband did? Yeah. Sergio, who just a few minutes before this had left the shelter, came running back to tell Rose the great news. Harry had left a message. <laughs> okay. Harry, it turns out, had been hunkered down in the couple's apartment in an evacuated zone near the Trade Center. Without electricity, without water, Harry didn't know whether Rose was alive or dead. No one thought to look for him there. Sergio and Red Cross officials then produced their version of when Harry met Rosie. I didn't really lose it. It was Sergio's notice in the armory that did it when it happened to show up in a local TV news report. A neighbor saw it and told Harry. <laughs> I didn't tell you where you were, but I would never have gone home. After I met Sergio, we get home. For Sergio, confirmation of his notion of what volunteering is all about. We have to concentrate on the small things. Go to a place. And when you find somebody sitting down, sit down by their side like I did and talk to them. And you might be surprised of the information that you can get. And just one person, stick with that person. And with that information, you can, you can make a miracle happen. Where's Sergio? Sergio! Sergio was with me. Right here. And I, I saw you. <laughs> Bruce Burkhardt, CNN, New York. My goodness, we are uh, joined by Pamela Dixon and Jamela Persall. Yes. Persall? Yes. How'd I do? Um, Pamela's fiance, I'm sorry, Pamela's son sorry. and Jamela's fiance uh, are lost, is lost, he is lost in the rubble yes. of Trade Center One, um, Duan. Um, guys, show, show our viewers Duan and Pamela, tell me about your son. Tell me who he is, what he did, what he was doing that day. He works for um, mail operations. He works on the 96th floor. 
but when he comes in, he would go to that floor and then go downstairs to the 93rd floor, where I believe the main mail hub is. But he was early that day, so we're not exactly sure where he was in the building. I don't know if he was on the elevator or if he got the 96 and before he was going down the 93, I know he always told me he took the steps going from 96 to 93 if he didn't have anything heavy. So I'm not sure if he's on the staircase or if he's on uh, in the elevator or just was stuck on the floor somewhere. We don't know where he is. Do you have hope at this yes, point? Yes, I you? do. I'm not giving up. Okay. It is, he is not just a 20-year-old kid working in an office building. He was, uh, he was a father? Yes. Yeah. He was a father. You're doing fine, okay? You're doing fine. Uh, of an 8-year-old, yes. right? Yes. Um, tell me when you last saw him. Um, I saw him that morning. Um, he told my daughter to behave herself in school, and he told her that he loved her. I didn't get a chance to speak to him because I was in a bedroom and um, she was in the living room, so um, the last thing he said to me, he was going to mail something for me, and he said, I have the papers you need, and I'll talk to you later. It's the last thing he said to me. It was an utterly routine, yes, it's the kind was. of goodbye you have every kind of working day yes. in your life. Yes, he was a hard worker. He was at work almost every day, even Never when he was sick. With no one. Even when he was sick, he was there. He was a wonderful, wonderful guy. When, tell me, I, I, I know this is hard, okay? Yeah. <laughs> it, it, I know, and tell me when you heard uh, the news of the blast. Mm -hmm. I saw did, it from my window at work. I did. worked for the same company, and I was at, when I got to work, everybody was standing, looking out the window, and someone was grabbing me, saying, Pam, the World Trade, and I'm screaming, oh my God, my son is there. And as I'm looking at the building, with all the smoke, all of a sudden, the, I saw the building fall, and I fell with it. I fell with it. They was trying to take me away from the window. I saw it. Yeah. And when you heard the news, Jamal? Um, I had just dropped my daughter off at school, and I came back in the house, and um, something told me to call his office. Is that right? <sighs> oh. uh, I called his take, office. Just, take a breath and take your time. You're doing fine. It was like a quarter to nine. When I called the office, um, a recording came on, and it said um, the um, circuits were, you know, not working, temporary interrupted. So, um, at this, like a little while after that, my mom called. She beeped in actually, and she called and told me, um, turn on the TV, look at the World Trade, something's going on. And by that time, um, I think it was a little while, a little while after the second plane hit, uh, I just, my heart dropped. I mean, he was my friend. <laughs> he was more than my companion, he was my friend. Let's stop. Let's stop. We give it up. You still there? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. This is so awful, isn't it? It's, it's, it's about as bad as it gets in life. I, I, um, I appreciate very much. Uh, I, I can't imagine. None of us can imagine what you're going through. None of us. I'm and walking around would, without a heart. That, that you would come and talk to us in a moment like this is much appreciated. I think it reminds people what this is really about, that yes. this is not about just buildings, but it's about lives. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. But can Thank we you. say... Sure, what do you can want? Can we ask anyone who saw him? Absolutely. Between the 93rd floor and the 97th floor, um, anyone, if you saw him, he was well known throughout the company. He worked on the 96th floor, but he delivered mail to different areas of the building. So he could have been anywhere at that time. We need to hear from any mailroom 
uh, people, any uh, technology people, anyone in that area anyone who may have saw him. Anyone who knows anything. In the staircase, anyone, can you please, please contact us? Because please. all information matters right now. Yes. Thank you both again. Thank you so much for having Thank us. You. Thank God you. bless. Thank you. Aaron. Aaron. It is so hard and people really wondering what they can do. Here at CNN and at CNN.com, we've come up with one small thing in trying to help people find their relatives and their loved ones. Of course, you've seen the pictures of people going throughout New York City holding up pictures just as that family just did, wondering if there would be any information on if people had seen those loved ones. We've done something here at CNN.com. I'm going to turn your attention to our website here. Of course, if you go to the home page, you'll see the big red banner with a special report. But if you scroll down a little bit on CNN.com, you'll see a part where it talks about missing. Send photos and view photos. And if you click onto that area, you come up with an area that allows you both to view photos of people who might have been missing if you were anywhere near the World Trade Center on Tuesday. Also, if you're one of the desperate families looking for information about one of your relatives or loved ones, we're encouraging you to send photos into the website. It tells you there how to do it. We want to feature one person whose picture is on CNN.com. Oh, I think. All right, well, I'm going to go through it with you just to show you how it works. Um, you, cl you click on to view photos work with me here and then you'll see there's the, the alphabet we're going to be featuring Bridget Esposito so we're going to the first area A through F here's her name under E Bridget Esposito and we click on you can see Bridget Thomas Esposito 34 her hometown uh, we don't have right now her employer was American Express Travel at Marsh USA we have with us on the phone right now Bridget's father Maurice Thomas Mr. Thomas thanks for joining us today you're welcome we have just basic information about your daughter on our website. Five foot three, 120 pounds, dark brown hair, dark brown eyes. Uh, last seen on the 94th, flo 94th floor of the first tower. What else can you tell us about your daughter that doesn't fit into this simple form that we have here on CNN.com? Well, Bridget is originally from Brooklyn, and Brooklyn, New York, and she has always been a fantastic kid. I mean, as a youngster, some days I was looking for her, and she would be in some elderly person's home, mm. keeping their company. She's mm -hmm. been such a lovely girl. Mm. We we didn't call it and want to get you on the phone to get you upset. We we want no, just one. No, it's quite all right. Yeah, I understand. Everything helps. Can you tell us what she did? What she was doing for American Express Travel? She was a travel uh, agent. Uh, doing corporate travel for Marsh McLennan, one of their accounts. So it was like an on-hand travel. So you know? she would have been at work on Tuesday morning, just like many Tuesday mornings. She started at 7 a.m. until 3 p.m. and at about 20 minutes to 9, one of her friends, Myra, who lives in Florida, called her and spoke to her minutes before the blast. I was at at hospice because I I volunteered there mm. singing for the for the the dead or the families whatever and my wife called me and I turned the television on and just went into shock when was the last time you were able to speak with your daughter on Monday night and what did, she called what did you talk and about she, and she spoke to my wife and she said I just had a bad dream that daddy died mm. I don't know if that's a premonition, premonition of her own death. Were you able to talk with her that night, too? No, I was asleep, and my wife didn't want to wake me. We see, of course, that your family or someone has sent in this picture of her for anybody who does have information about Bridget. Are you still hopeful that she'll be found, that uh, perhaps maybe she was injured and is at one of the hospitals and you haven't been able to make contact yet? Her sister, Yvette, who... The two of them, I've never seen two sisters so close. They're best friends. She has been in the streets with Bridget's husband, Michael mm -hmm. Esposito, every day from about 11 in the morning to 11 at night, going to all the hospitals, walking around. Uh, Yvette has been carrying a picture of, of Bridget. She has been interviewed all over. And uh, we have a son who is living in Atlanta, and we're all 
trying to do whatever we can. I've not gone to New York because I, I have some bad legs. I, I can't walk very mm. far. And uh, my daughter Yvette said, Dad, there's nothing you can do here because you can't drive around and you have to walk all day and you can't do it. So I'm mm. waiting for any slight words. So if, if, if it is closure, then I'll go. Well, we understand you, you're doing your part today, sir, by talking with us here on CNN, by sending the message and sending your daughter's story across the country and around the world. And I realize this is such a difficult time for you and your family. I want to thank you for taking time out to talk with us and draw attention to Bridget's picture and her story. And certainly, we wish you the best of luck. And I heard there are about 1,700 people in hospitals in Jersey. I don't know, but Yvette has different parts, like hair of... Bridget's uh, for DNA or whatever. I don't know. Well, we will hold out hope for you, sir, and your family that I, Bridget is, is one of those who, who is in the hospital. And once again, we do send our best. That's uh, Maurice Thomas, father of Bridget Thomas Esposito, one of the many, many missing people at the World Trade Center. We want to encourage you, too, if you have a missing loved one, please send your photos. We'll post them for you on CNN.com. The email address to send them along and the information is very simple, missing at CNN.com. And if you need more information, just log on to CNN.com, onto our website, click on Missing Photos, and all the directions are right there for you to send along the photos and the information. We really, really are, are trying to help. Aaron, up to you. Thank you. Uh, let me, I just want to say one thing briefly here. These are very difficult uh, things to, to hear. This is, um, you stand here with people whose hearts are breaking and there's a very fine line here and we are very aware of it. But it's important, I think, not only to help to get information out on people, but it is also important to remind you and all of us who do this that these are not numbers. These are people who have uh, kids and moms and girlfriends and and the whole thing they're, they're, they're not famous people they're not in the, they're not going to appear on the front page of any paper but they are real people and it's important to keep that in mind in all of this down on the streets the uh, recovery effort continues on this sunny saturday in new york lauren savage has been on the streets near ground zero for the last three or four days marty come on in Aaron, we've been talking to people as they come and go, talking to people who are involved in the rescue operation. Robert Perry is one of those people. He is what is known professionally as a pile driver. I guess more generally you could call him a construction worker. And he has been working on the building and the debris field today. Tell us what you've been doing down there, Robert. We've been cutting a lot of the large steel sections out of the way to allow the uh, demolition contractors to remove the smaller debris so that hopefully as they search through it, if there's any survivors and or bodies, that they can uh, access them. Now, this is not steel girders as they used to be. This is steel that's no. been twisted and torn. No, it's, and... it's like it's, it's never been. It's, uh, it's dangerous because there's a lot of stress on it um, because of its position, because of the way it was uh, driven down by the floors on top of it. And it has to be handled uh, correctly with rigging so that when we do cut it away, it doesn't rip out or fan out or come back into the crane or the hoisting apparatus or, uh, or, or hurt other people, which, you know, we really don't need at this point. Do they tell you specifically where to cut? Yes, the, there's, there's uh, supervisors there and structural engineers that are uh, making sure that uh, too big of pieces aren't taken at one time, that uh, pieces that would, uh, that might swing unruly uh, if they're not cut into small enough pieces. Uh, aren't aren't removed prior to the sequence that they need to be in here. Well, let me since let me ask you this: since you've been down there and you know far better than most of us, when we talk about the issue of hope and the possibility of survival, what do you think the chances are? Oh, there's definitely good possibilities. There's I've been told by workers who have actually been in the subterranean portion that there's uh, there's a lot of nooks and crannies and and bigger areas that somebody could possibly hold up. In. Plus, there's a lot of snack shops with water, food, uh, it, you know, it's conceivable that somebody could be alive under there for a couple of weeks if they just have the patience and the, the, 
you know, the hardness to, to stick out the trauma. You mentioned that you had heard some of those who had gone down there had seen some areas literally untouched. I overheard a couple of the uh, rescue personnel saying that they've been in areas of the uh, sub-basement where the, in the mall area that there's a lot of, a lot of uh, activity as far as uh, shops, all of the water. I think some of the water is even still running. What are they using to try to investigate these areas? I know people go down there at the camp, but what if the area is too small? What else do they use? Well, they use like uh, cameras mounted on uh, extension poles, telescopic poles. They use uh, listening devices, which is hard to use because of the surrounding collateral noise. But uh, they have like um, those fiber optic cameras that they're using and so forth. I saw some of the crews that are using those. They've got quite a bit of every kind of piece of equipment, you know, that they could possibly use as there. Have you heard of people hearing noises, hearing sounds, indications? I've only what you've also heard, but I've never heard specifically from any any one person. I overheard a couple of firemen talking that they think they might have heard someone, someone further up on the, the scrap pile that, that you know, I was away from. Today was the first day you went to work. First yes. time you've been down there, yes. and yes. you walk up face to face. What did you think? It looks just.